Hello everybody and welcome! We got another feature episode for Kerbal Space Program 2, the fifth in total. And as usual, I'm going to break it down for you. At the end, I'll share a few of my thoughts what we can expect after this until the release and when that might be. So, here we go! Five new things we learned about interstellar travel in Kerbal Space Program 2. This will be huge! One of the things the developers in this update are focusing on is the scale of the game, especially how far another star really is to the one you call home. If you have played the original Kerbal Space Program, you will probably appreciate how immense the distances between planets and moons felt the first time you tried to reach one of them. This increased, of course, the further you went to the outside of the solar system. But let's look at the real world for a second. Light takes about 8 minutes from the Sun to hit Earth. It takes more than 5 hours to reach Pluto. It took the New Horizons probe, the fastest flying vehicle we ever built, 9 years to reach Pluto. And Pluto is less than a thousandth of the distance of a light year away from the Sun. The closest star to our own solar system, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.3 light years away. It's really hard to wrap your head around the enormity of these distances. And the developers want to help us appreciate it a little bit more with Kerbal Space Program 2. To traverse these distances in the game, you will need new technology. One of the engines rated for interstellar travel, called the Crucible, is supposedly larger than the entire vehicle assembly building on your home planet Kerbin, as senior designer Tom Venita tells us in the video. This will necessitate orbital construction facilities. And we even get a glimpse of the letters OAB near the end of the feature video. It's safe to assume this stands for Orbital Assembly Building. We can also get a sense of how large these interstellar engines and ships really are by comparing them to things we are already familiar with. We see that this ship has two smaller craft attached that use parts from the first game. If the developers kept the parts as they were, these engines have a diameter of 1.25 meters. We can now check how many of those we can overlay onto the diameter of the engine bell. The result is 47, which would mean this engine bell alone is almost 60 meters wide. Of course, we have to take perspective into account here in this shot, so it's probably a bit less, but still, this thing is gigantic. KSP2 is coming at us with the huge ambition to make us feel in awe of our universe. And there's something else. The developers claim that you will be able to see a star on the horizon of the planet you stand on, and you will be able to travel there, and it will be simulated the entire time from beginning to end. <laughs> That's quite a tall order and makes me recall some of the broken promises made before No Man's Sky was launched. Still, they actually might pull it off. And of course, it won't be possible for every star in that beautiful skybox we can see in the gameplay shots throughout the video. But this leads me to my next item. How will interstellar travel work? Again, experience with the original KSP is going to help. You will set your target, light years away, plan a maneuver and try to hit it a couple of years, probably decades later. If you have done this in the original with targets really far away, you will remember how finicky it can be to even get an encounter with a distant object. Every minuscule change in velocity at your starting point has huge effects the further your destination is away. If you are off by maybe a meter per second, you could miss your target entirely. <laughs> now imagine targets as far away as other stars. The developers have a good analogy for this problem during the video. Traveling to the moon is like shooting an arrow at it. Traveling interstellar is like trying to hit a grape on the surface of the moon. So how will we even be able to do that? Well, the developers claim to have completely revamped the maneuvering system in KSP2, not only in regards to how it will present itself, but also under the hood to take into account something like brachistochrone trajectories. 
which I'm trying to explain in a simple way, as much as I can understand them. If you have a very efficient propulsion system, in theory you could do a full burn until you're halfway to your target, then turn around and burn again to reduce your velocity so that you will arrive at your destination in a safe orbit and not overshoot it. If you are familiar with the science fiction series The Expanse, which I highly recommend by the way, they use this method to travel through the solar system with what they call the Epstein drive, of course a fictional technology. I tried something like that in the first KSP a while back, using an over-engineered ion craft to travel from Kerbin to Joule in just 160 days. But if you're going to do these really long burns to reach another star system, will KSP2 force you to babysit your vehicle as the original did? Luckily, the answer is no, and a dev diary from February already gave us a hint on that. It describes how the resource system has been overhauled and improved. Not only will this enable us to time warp during a burn, it will also enable us to switch vehicles during that burn. The game no longer requires that the engine is loaded into the physics simulation, it will continue to consume resources, in this case propellant, even when you are away doing something else. In short, you could either play just your interstellar ship and time warp years ahead for it to reach its destination, or you can start the burn, launch another mission to closer destinations in between, and the large mothership will still soldier on in the background. But how will they make sure that all of this is going to work correctly? Well, that's actually my next item on the list. The Doctor is in! The developers of Kerbal Space Program 2 have been working together with real rocket scientists and engineers right from the start to make sure things are as accurate as possible to real-world physics. In this episode we see them having a conversation with Paul Gilster, author of Centauri Dreams, a compendium of all research surrounding interstellar travel. But they also have a secret weapon on their team. Well, not so secret now that we saw it in the video. Well, it, rather, him. I'm talking about Dr. Michael Dodd, who is a physics engineer at Intercept Games, the studio developing KSP2. He is there to make sure things work as they should, and he definitely has the credentials to do so. For starters, he has a PhD in aerospace, aeronautical, and astronautical engineering. He also did research on transcritical gas liquid flows at Stanford, which was funded by NASA. And to top things off, he has worked on turbulent flow simulations on a supercomputer named Kraken. Yeah, I'm not making this up. The KSP2 team has a guy on board that has actually dealt with the Kraken. Well, a Kraken, at least until 2014, when that specific supercomputer was retired. <laughs> My point is, I am confident that the developers have the necessary know-how on board to make sure Kerbal Space Program 2 will adhere to how physics dictates that the game's world should behave. But all of this talk of Kraken reminds me, there was something rather interesting in the video about that. Killing the Kraken. If you were wondering why I emphasized Kraken for the past minute or so and have no idea what that is about, here's a little history lesson. The original Kerbal Space Program was at times a buggy mess that led to hilarious things happening which were lovingly dubbed as the Kraken causing this mayhem. The developers later added a dead baby Kraken on Jules Moon Bob as an easter egg for players to find. But if you play a lot of KSP, after a while you are no longer amused by frequent weirdness, you just want the game to work. And it appears the developers want to make sure the mythical beast from the original will never rear its head again. Our ultimate goal is to slay the Kraken. That is a bold claim, Tom. I certainly hope you will be able to pull it off. And you can bet that I will test the limits of the game to see whether or not you actually did it. Here's the thing though. 
The stated goal of killing the Kraken is kind of in contrast to something else we can find in this episode, or should I say, something more? A secret message! By now it is tradition to have some kind of easter egg within these feature episodes. Near the one minute mark there is a fly safe flag on the moon, a clear nod to space YouTube legend Scott Manley's signature sign off greeting. But we also had fragments of a coded message in the audio near at the end of these videos, usually in a chapter titled something more? As it turns out, these coded messages are similar to the Arecibo message and of course it has already been decoded. Here it is. This is what we can see now. A star system with the third planet highlighted, a rocket flying, a kraken appearing, a rocket exploding, and then a dotted line to signify the end of the message. So. If Tom wants to slay the Kraken, why is it still destroying rockets in this coded message? Hmm? Well, that's the things I was able to distill out of episode 5 of these feature videos. Did I miss something? What did you notice while watching it? Tell me down there in the comments below or over on my Discord server, link is in the description. There were some tiny details in there that I did not put into a separate item, like where we can see the camera zooming out of a solar system and we can see these disks, probably a young system that is still in formation, maybe the one that is home to Gerdama, a planet we talked about in a previous video. But we need to speak about the things the video did not address. While interstellar travel was a big talking point right from the start, so was multiplayer. We have seen bits and pieces for the interstellar part of KSP2 right from the get-go. New types of engines and ships, new planets and moons. But so far we never ever have seen or heard anything in regards to multiplayer over the past two and a half years. We know that they are working on it, or at least did so, because they were searching for multiplayer designers a while back. But we haven't really heard any details surrounding that. And the question remains, will we even hear about that before release? Will this feature even make the cut for Kerbal Space Program 2? To be fair, this is not the only part of the game we don't know a lot about. Will there be a contract system similar to the original? Will there be other types of missions or tasks you are expected to perform? What about the science system? Will there be new types of science, things like telescopes maybe? We have seen rockets, planes and rovers, at least in the trailer, but will there maybe be floating things like boats or submarines? As much as the developers have been trying to be transparent, I get the feeling there is still a mountain of stuff they haven't shown us yet. So when will we be able to find out? If we look at the timeline of how communication went since the announcement trailer in August 2019, we can see that there is a 4-6 to six month gap between these feature episodes. The keen-eyed among you will probably ask, why are there 7 featurettes marked on your timeline when the video is titled Episode 5? Here's the reason for that. The first one was the developer story trailer accompanying the announcement in August 2019. They only introduced the episode numbers starting in February 2020. Then there was an episode 1.5, because the real number 2 had to be delayed due to the coronavirus pandemic. So that's why there are 7 entries, but only 5 official episodes. Nevertheless, if Private Division, the publisher of Kerbal Space Program 2, sticks to their schedule, there will be another feature video in autumn, probably around September October. Or maybe even a bit earlier at Gamescom 2022, an event scheduled at the end of August. This would be roughly three years after the original announcement, made at Gamescom. And it might already be a sort of release video. There are a few indications that this might be the case. The game was delayed multiple times, but they are still sticking to 2022 as their targeted release date. And Take Two, the company that owns Private Division as well as the development studio Intercept Games, 
announced in their investor call that the game is scheduled for their fiscal year 2023, which has just started and will end in March 2023. So there is ample time for KSP to come out this year, 2022, and still be in fiscal year 2023. That's corporate business for you. <laughs> Judging from how marketing for premium games usually happens, they will want to come out in time for the Christmas holidays, because that time traditionally is very strong for video game sales. Also, the Something More segments at the end are bits and pieces of a mission to the moon if you stitch them together. It appears that we are close to a moon landing at the end of the current episode. And sticking the landing is also a term used to finishing a project. You could also argue that this game is the developer's moonshot. Okay, I'll stop with the metaphors now. In short, we can expect this. A dev diary or two to bridge us over until autumn. Then a big release date announcement around Gamescom together with the final feature episode. At that time they will probably open pre-orders. We will then see a big marketing campaign with developers touring conventions like Gamescom or PAX West to advertise the game. Barring any further delays, I would expect October to be the actual release date. And maybe, just maybe, I will get another chance to ask creative director Nate Simpson the same question I asked him almost three years ago. Imagine it's 2022. You managed to get Kerbal Space Program 2 released and everything was successful. Looking back from that point to now, what was the number one thing that enabled you to make that success happen, you and your team? Dang. Let's find out. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.